Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time and traveling this morning to be with us at the Academy of Masonic Knowledge. Uh, it's truly uh, a great thing for us to be able to come back together and meet in our congregations and in our Masonic events. And uh, as you see, uh, uh, we've uh, really, it's been almost two years since our last meeting, but uh, we've uh, struggled and we persevered as Masons. And here we are, restocking again, launching again, like many times in our history, through many uh, struggles in the past, and uh, always triumphing and continuing. Uh, it gives me uh, a great pleasure to welcome you here this morning, and thank you again for being here. As in all our uh, proceedings, we'll start with uh, an invoc invocation of the Lord, Brother Erastus Allen. Please approach. Great architect of the universe, we beseech thee to bless this, our present undertaking. We pray that you will prepare our hearts, minds, and consciences to receive the light of our speakers presenting at this Academy of Masonic Knowledge meeting. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and share our insights and knowledge of the craft with one another after an extended period. In thy name we pray, amen. So mote it be. At this time, we will perform the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this point, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Right Worshipful Brother Larry A. Durr, uh, Right Worshipful Senior Grand Warden of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Right Worshipful Sir, would you please approach the podium? Good morning. Thank you, yes, sir. Uh, on behalf of the Right Worshipful Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, our Right Worshipful Grand Master, Thomas Gammon IV, 
I'd like to welcome everyone here today. As Yasser has said, it's been almost two years since the Academy has met, and uh, I've always, always got a great deal of information, and I've always enjoyed hearing our speakers, and today will be no different. We have some very interesting speakers to speak to you, so I'm looking forward to the day, and I hope that you enjoy it as well. So, Yasser, thank you, and uh, we will continue. At this time, it gives me great pleasure also to introduce the members of the Academy uh, Committee. Um, not with us, and those who are with us. Uh, George E. Haynes, chairman, is not able to be with us this morning. Uh, we have, you've met Right Worshipful Larry A. Bear, Right Worshipful Dwayne Caesar Warden, who's with us today. He's a member of the Academy's committee. Uh, Seth C. Anthony is our secretary, also was not able to be to make it this morning. Uh, Brother Orestes V. Allen, who uh, performed our prayer earlier. Uh, Lynn Bud Baker, if you don't mind rising so everybody can see you and know you. Um, Bill Britton is also a member of this committee and wasn't able to be here. Robert De Palma had a family emergency this morning, so uh, he had his plans changed, and he's the district deputy grandmaster. Uh, Peter M. Kraut, past district deputy grandmaster. Uh, Scott Mueller, past district deputy grandmaster. Paul J. Rout, past district deputy grandmaster and our gr uh, junior grand warden elect. Uh, he was not able to be with us this morning. Theodore W. Schick, Jr. also uh, sends his regrets. And with us is Richard Wenner. Thank you, thank you all. And myself, Yasser A. al a member of the Academy's community too. Um, as you heard, we have a great program this morning. Uh, this is how the events will proceed this morning. We will do the recognition first of the scholars and those who have completed levels. We will then proceed with our program with the three speakers that we have. We will defer the questions and answers till after lunch once the presentations are done, we're gonna head to lunch, and when we come back, we will complete or do our Q and A's uh, session at this point. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I would ask um, Right Worshipful Brother Larry if you would uh, join me, and Orestes and Alan, if you would join me down there, and we'll, we'll call on the, all the honorary recipients. For level one, I'm going to call first on Brother Benjamin Littman. Please approach. Ben has completed the level one scholar uh, in, in our uh, academy. Turn around and be in the picture, please. Congratulations, Ben. Is, I know Christopher Reed is not here. Uh, he couldn't make it this morning for a work-related event. Is Scott Watkins here, Brother Scott? Yes. Brother Sean T. Dougherty. I don't think I saw him this morning. Okay. And I know Leonard Altieri from Community Lodge is not here this morning either. Seth Anthony, our secretary, has completed level one also. And finally, Lance Stange, senior, has completed level one. Now, brethren, you're going to hear some names repeated more than once because you can imagine over the course of the last two years, some did not, were not be able to come here. We didn't have the meeting and couldn't get their levels. So you might hear some names being repeated in level two and level three also. Stange again, level two. Leonard Altieri completed level two also. 
Brian E. Peters. Is Brother Brian here? Nope. Okay. Brian Beschler. Okay. Joseph Nieli. James Proctor, level two. Scott Watkins. Ryan Kalasic is not here. And finally for level two, Andrew Nightingale. Happy to have you. I would like to call now on level three recipients, starting with brother and friend, John J. Heatherson, who has completed all three levels during this pandemic. John, please approach. the recipients also could not make it this morning. Another brother that completed all three levels during the last two years is Brother Robert uh, Burke, who I was on the phone with last night, and he uh, sends his regrets and looks forward to receiving this at his district uh, sometime soon. Lance Stang, you also you heard me repeat his name twice earlier with level one and level two, has completed level three. Jeremy Johnson, Brother Jeremy had uh, moved during the pandemic or right before the pandemic down to Texas, so we will be sending this uh, to him. For work purposes, he moved down to Texas. He was originally from there and was uh, finishing his studies up here in Pennsylvania and became a dual member. Uh, James uh, Davis actually is also now had moved down to Texas. He got stationed down in Texas for a while, and now he's in Georgia serving in our armed forces, and he couldn't be here. Uh, Leonard Altieri, as I mentioned, couldn't be here, and he has also completed all three levels while um, uh, during the pandemic. Brother Jack Spies, past district deputy grandmaster, I don't see him here today with us, but he also completed the Master of Masonic Scholar level, and I'm sure there will be a presentation for him at some point. Uh, Chris Lee Rowan, Chris here, I don't see him. And Brother Kevin Wheeler, who's a dual member between here and Illinois, in Pennsylvania and Illinois, also had um, completed all three levels and obtained or uh, achieved the Master Masonic Scholar level. Um, unfortunately, these brethren couldn't be with us here today, but at this point, I would like to ask all Master Masonic Scholars to rise and be acknowledged. Thank you, brethren. Thank you. While down here, I truly want to also acknowledge a few brethren that have helped uh, tremendously with this effort this morning. Uh, Tony Dentino, Anthony J. Dentino III, Master Masonic Scholar, thank you so much for being here this morning. Benjamin Lippman, uh, Brother Benjamin, thank you for your help this morning. Uh, Brother Eric Krokstad, also Master Masonic Scholar in the back helping with uh, our uh, streaming and recording for this event and audio. Uh, Brother Nick Lapice, uh, past master, also helping this morning. Thank you so much for being uh, dedicated to, to the Academy and to Masonic Knowledge.
like to introduce our first speaker, Brother Chick Cicero. Charles Chick Cicero was born in Buffalo, New York. An early love of music, particularly of the saxophone, resulted in Chick's many years of experience as a lead musician in several jazz, blues, and rock ensembles. Working with many famous performers in the music industry, Chick's interest in Freemasonry and the Western esoteric tradition resulted in research articles on Rosicrucianism and the Knights Templar, printed in such publications as Ars Quatora Coronatum and the 1996-2000 transactions of the Metropolitan College of the SRIA. Chick is a member of several Masonic, Martinist, and Rosicrucian organizations. He is a past Grand Commander of the Grand Commandery of Knights Templars in Florida, 2010 to 2011, and he currently serves as the Chief Adept for the Florida College of Soceras Rosicruciana in Civitabis uh, Quadratus. He was also a close personal friend and confidant of Dr. Israel Rigardi. Having established a Golden Dawn Temple in 1977, Chick was one of the key people who helped Rigardi to resurrect it as a legitimate initiatory branch of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in the United States in the early 1980s. He met his wife and co-author Sandra Tabitha Cicero shortly thereafter. Both Chick and Tabitha are chief adepts of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn as re-established re by Israel Rigardi. It is my great honor to welcome Chick with us here in Pennsylvania. Chick, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you all. And this is a brief history of the relationship between Freemasonry, the Golden Dawn, and uh, Rosicrucianism, and so forth. And we're going to start off, uh, basically I'm going to try to explain the history of how this all came about. Know with myself, I started in 1977. It's been a long time since I've been working at this, a little over 40 years. And it's one of these things that uh, you work at, and the combination of being a Freemason and uh, working with the Golden Dawn. Uh, Sometimes the two come together, and uh, you see the relationship between them. It's totally amazing every time I think about it and uh, work with it how much and how little I know because you're constantly learning. It's a constant learning process that everyone and everybody should, and hopefully, well, I know we all as Masons are working to be better men. We, uh, this will bring you, this type of teachings then bring you on to a, another position in life which we call the spiritual or consecrated man. So it all has, it's all part of uh, who we are and what we hope to be. We are human beings first and then we want to make it that, that attachment to the spirituality within us to make us better men. And on top of that, understand who and why we're here. So let me go on and let me talk to you a little bit about the light and extension. And that's Pulk, Psalm Pox, light and extension the LDX formulas, and so forth. Now, 
No organization has had a greater impact on the Western esoteric tradition or the Western ceremonial, ceremonial magic than that of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. In 1888, a, by a group of Kabbalists, Rosicrucians, and Freemasons, it would be hard to find a magical order that has not borrowed heavily, and I mean that seriously. They have borrowed and continually taken parts of the teachings and have encompassed it. And they never really give credit to the Golden Dawn. It, it's sort of a, it's always been a society that's been in the background. So I know many of you have probably never heard of it. But if you do go into your library, and especially Mackey's Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia, you will find the teachings of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The study and the curriculum is used in modern esoteric practice. Standard Golden Dawn rituals and exercises such as the Lesser, Basser, lesser Vanishing Ritual of the Pentagram and the middle pillar exercise have been virtually cooperated by the numerous other groups and cooperated, co-opted, or cooperated <laughs> by numerous other groups. Like a Masonic fraternity, the Golden Dawn is not a religion. Although religious imagery and spiritual concepts play an important role in its work, members are usually admitted to the order by the way of ritual initiation. That is infused with the magical discipline such as the energized visualization. The Golden Dawn is called the Hermetic Order because it is focused on the magical occult sciences derived by the Western esoteric tradition, also known as Hermeticism. This refers to Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes Thrice Great, the Greek and God Hermes figure said to be the first and the greatest of all magicians, as well as the founder of the arts and sciences. The heart of the Golden Dawn system of magic is often referred to as theurgy. Now this is important because it can be confused. It is called theurgy, which means God workings. God workings. Its goal is summed up in the obligation of the Adeptus Minor, which states, I further promise I swear that with the divine permission, I will from this day forward apply myself to the great work, which is to purify and exalt my spiritual nature so that with the divine aid I may at length attain to, the more, to be more than human and thus gradually raise and unite myself to my higher and divine genius. This is the light that guides the path of the Golden Dawn initiate. Now when I say more than human, I don't mean that you're becoming something. It, it's the edge that you get from the teachings, the study, just as in masonry. You get, you're given an edge over the common man who just goes to work and does his thing, watches television, goes to sleep, and so forth. This, these teachings give you that edge to find out who you are and what you represent in this universe that we all live in. 
The great work indicates a journey for union with the divine. Union with the divine. Although the practice of magic often involves consecrating talismans, performing invocations, divinations, and similar methods. And now I want to explain the word magic. I'm not talking about some guy taking a rabbit out of a hat. Magic was corrupted probably around 13 or 1400. It was a process that we all, they all used and still uses today. The true meaning of magic is the self-realization of who you are and, and what you're good. It's, it's not that trickery. Uh, they, the trickster took the word magic and turned it into something that it really isn't. So don't, don't get that confused when I say magic. It is the communion with the sacred source. Everything else is a distant second. What led us up to the creation of the Golden Dawn? Just what exactly was in the air? To understand this, we can overstate the importance of the Hermetic. The Hermetic text said to have been written by the legendary priest and magician Hermes Trismegistus. Although the Hermetic books were not very different from other ancient texts or philosophy, they became extremely important because of the high position given to them by the Renaissance. The Renaissance thinkers of the 15th and 16th centuries, they were also judged to be acceptable to the Christian church. Now this is very important because the Christian church accepted them. For nearly a 1,500 years, highly usually for books written by an Egyptian initiate who was named after a pagan god. And because of this remarkable acceptance, the, Her the Hermetic books have played an important role in Western culture. In the mind of the Renaissance philosopher, Hermes Trismegistus had been a real person and a great teacher who had foreshadowed the teaching of Christ. There were active, actually two classes of hermetic literature, obviously not within the same person, but by several persons and people. The first most popular type, which dates from the third century, BC deals with the practice such as astrology, alchemy, the secret properties of the planets, gemstones, magic, medicine, and the making of talismans. The second more advanced type, which dates from the second and third century AD, is compromised of several books about religious philosophy. That is one of the nice things we have an opportunity in our studies. We try to study all the Bibles and the philosophies and compare them and, and get a sound, balanced feeling for the uh, religious aspects of them. In addition to a cryptic text known as the Emerald Tablet, the most important of the Hermetic books, such as the Divine Pymander, are contained in the Corpus Hermeti Hermeticism. They describe the creation of the universe, cosmic principles, the divine soul, the nature of humanity, and the spiritual beings, man's desire to know, the, know God, to know God, and the way to achieve spiritual rebirth. Both types of hermetic books, magically and philosophically, 
shared the same origin, separating them into two groups was purely a modern distinction that would have been meaningless in ancient times. The more philo philosophical books even furnish a, re a rational for conducting experiments in ritual magic. However, the greatest practical magic that was contained within the text had to do with the perfecting of humanity. The perfecting of humanity. The recognition of the sacred. The sacred spark within the human soul and the means by which the sparks could be reinfused to the divine books. Armed with the corpus hermeticism, Renaissance philosophers such as Marcelio Fincini began to praise the positive natures of what they called natural magic or the natural science of the celestial bodies. Fincino studied student Pico della Mirandola was the first prominent Christian scholar to embrace the Jewish Kabbalah, placing it in the front of the Hermetic tradition and changing that tradition forever. The, word, the world view adopted by the Hermeticism was basically a magic, magical one. Eventually, it was considered as an esoteric, esoteric outer, outer faith of the general public. Another important influence was the Rosicrucians. Was Rosicrucianism a mystical and philo philosophical movement that emerged? in Germany in the 17th century and was said to have been created by the mystical founder Christian Rosenkreutz. The primary texts of the Rosicrucians, the Fama, the Cacretio, and the Chemical Wedding were written anonymously, giving the movement an irresistible aura, an aura of mystery and intrigue. The Rosicrucian movement spawned several groups concerned with the study of Christian mysticism, philosophical and religious doctrine, alchemy, Kabbalah, and spiritual transformation. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, saw the rise of the Age of Enlightenment. Ah, the Age of Enlightenment. An intellectual reaction against witch hunts and religious persecution of early times. Its roots can be traced back to the humanism of the Renaissance, which promoted science and academic interests and classical texts and values. The Age of Enlightenment was marked by the celebration of re reason, of reason, the faculty by which human beings comprehend the universe and advance them, their own existence, knowledge, freedom, and happiness were considered to be the goals of the, re the rational or thinking human being. Ironically, extreme rationalism of the 18th century was countered by the renewed interest in mysticism, secret societies, and Freemasons. The tradition of the past were examined from nuggets of spiritual wisdom. They included ancient Egyptian religion, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, classical Greek philosophy, and Neoplatonism. There were also a number of attempts to recre recreate the practical version of the initiation rites of the ancient mysteries. Religion. Some of these were inspired by the Kabbalist teachings, such as the Martinus, Martin, Martis, Martinus de Pasquale, the rite of the elect Cohens, the Martinus order, or Louis Claude de Saint Martin, 
and quasi-Martin Masonic orders, such as the Egyptian Rite of Freemasonry, created by Count Alessandro Castiglione. Eventually, the Age of Enlightenment fell victim to the own extreme, although its optimistic view of human progress survived. The reaction against blind reason came in the form of the Romanticism, the cultural movement of the late 18th century. Rosicrucianism formed an individual expression of emotion, emotion and religious imagination as well as renewed inter interest in nature, the subjective personal, the spontaneous, the visionary, and the mystical. By the mid-1800s, Europe was experiencing a huge, a huge growth, a growth of interest in occultism, hermetic traditions, especially in England and France. The movement also called the French occult revival was spearheaded by individuals such as the former Catholic clergy, clergyman and writer Elitus Levi. Dogma and ritual of high magic would, would become a cornerstone of Western esoteric tradition. Levi pointed out the relationship between the 22 major cards of the tarot and the 22 letters of the hidden Hebrew alphabet, a concept that would later, later become an important part of the Golden Dawn's teachings. Levi, Levi's writing on the Kabbalists and the Kabbalah, the creation of talismans, and the idea of the astral life would also be embraced by the founders of the Golden Dawn. Another important figure in the occult revival of the 19th century was Frederick Hockley, a spiritualist, a Freemason, and a Rosicrucian. Hockley's experiments with spirit communication, scrying and clairvoyance, using crystals and magic mirrors, were recorded over 60 years, a 60-year span in 30 volumes or journals. He transcribed many unpublished works on Kabbalah, alchemy, and magic. Hockley's companion in the Rosicrucian Society would obtain head, have had in ex access to his work. The 19th century was a time of discovery as England continued to explore, explore the furthest reaches of the world. There was a great deal of curiosity above the traditions of the Celts and the mysticism of the Far East. There was also much interest in, in the ancient Egypt, fueled in no small part by Sir E. A. Wallace Budge, curator for the British Museum, Department of Egyptian and Assyrian Antiquities. Budge was able to secure several valuable manuscripts, Babylonian tablets, and Egyptian papyri from the British Museum, including a well-preserved version of the Book of the Dead, which contained a variety of religious and magical texts. At this time, there was an interest increased interest in Freemasonry. The worldwide fraternity that emphasized basic morality, an ethical growth through symbols such as the building of King Solomon's Temple, initiation into the various degrees of Masonry involved an elaborate system of symbolic ritual, a surge of main men wanted to become Masons and as a result, many new lodges were founded during that late 1800s. 
Masonic rites included secret treat passwords, signs, knocks, and grips, or handshakes, all of which would directly influence the structure of the Golden Dawn initiation. Ceremonies. When the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was founded in 1888, the name Hermes was invoked to describe a system that blended the many names of Hermes, many threads of the Hermetic tradition into a, a unified body of teachings, both practical and philosophical, designed to improve the spiritual health of its initiators. Now Westcott. I'm sure most of you have heard of Westcott. He had a lot to do with the recreation of the Rosicrucian in England, France, and here in the United States. He also had a lot to do with writings and teachings in the Masonic teachings that we have all studied. The Golden Dawn was also one of his brainchilds. Dr. William Westcott, ah, a London coroner, and physician, as well as a prominent Freemason. Westcott was an active member of Quattro Coronati Lodge, the English Association for Masonic Research. In, in 1891, Westcott became the Supreme Magus of the Society of Rosicrucians in Anglia, or the SRIA. a group composed of master masons. In esoteric circles, Westcott was widely re respected for his knowledge of the Kabbalah, alchemy, and the Hermetic philosophy. He published an impressive volumes of work in both the Hermetic and medical fields. Many esoteric books were translated by resolute uh, occultists, including the famous Kabbalistic text, the Sefer Yetzirah, and Levis Levi's treatise in Tarot, the magical ritual of the Sanctum Rectum. Westcott edited a series of Hermetic and Gnostic texts and published them as individual volumes of his Collectia Hermetica series. He also printed a few, a series of papers for the SRIA. I think most of you have heard of the SRIA in England, the Society of Rosicrucians in Anglia, including numbers, their occult power and mystic virtue, an introduction to the study of the Kabbalah, and the Rosicrucian past and present as, her, as at home and abroad. Westcott was interested in the many forms of masonry that thrived outside the traditional craft. He was acti actively involved in most of the esoteric orders that were in Britain at the time. However, many of the orders were theoretically study groups that did no practical work. Westcott, Westcott longed for something more. This is what's so important. He was restless. He studied. He did all the work in the Masonic bodies. And he wanted something more. He wanted something more. But he also put this knowledge to practical magical use. He imagined an order open to both men and women. Men and women. And was able to create the order after finding a manuscript written in cipher that contained the out outlines of the series of the quasi-Masonic quasi rituals and initiatory rites. Now, here's where the fun begins. The exact origin of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn have long been a point of debate. The dis dispute 
Center is on the set of practical papers called the Cipher Manuscripts. In 1886, Westcott acquired a set of documents written in cipher. They turned out to be coded outlines for the rituals and teachings of the magical order, but were and did but where did the cipher manuscripts come from? Where did they really come from? That was the big question. Westcott claimed that he got the papers from Reverend Adolphus Woodford, but that story seems unlikely. Woodford was an old, old man and who was said to have received the manuscripts from a dealer in, a, in curies, in curios. Some think that Westcott created this odd 60-odd page of cipher manuscripts. Others think they were written by Lord Butler, Lytton. Lytton, the authors of the occult novel called Zanoni. Others possible sources of the cipher manuscript were suggested, including a Jewish Masonic lodge in Frankfurt called Morgenroth, or Lodge of the Dawning Light, as well as the Kabbalistic College in London, headed by an influential rabbi named Joan Flock. Both of these groups were suspected to have ties to the mysterious Hermania Temple, number two of the Golden Dawn. However, there were no evidence to support of these, these theories. The leading Golden Dawn historian R.A. Gilbert claims that the cipher manuscripts were written by Kenneth McKenzie the author of the Royal Masonic Encyclopedia and a headed and a leading member of the SRIA, Mackenzie had known Elipis Levi and was a friend of Frederick Holland, another esoteric mason. The cipher manuscript was probably, probably intended to be the blueprint of the Society of Eight a Golden Dawn prototype group founded in 1883 by Frederick Hanlon, which never fully got off the ground. Westcott received the documents from Mackenzie. Mackenzie's widow in 1886, and a couple years later, the Golden Dawn came into being. The pages were written in cipher found in 1600, 16th century. Cryptographic books by Jacquin Trimitius called Polygraphia. It provided to be a series of ritual outlines for an occult order. Westcott finished out the outlines into full working rituals. With such a strong Masonic background, Westcott understood the idea of the organization through Hierarchy. Masonic lodges could not exist, exist without a legitimate charter from a grand lodge. Masonic lodges could not exist without a legitimate charter from a grand lodge. So, Westcott must have felt the need to provide evidence that the Golden Dawn was not something created out of thin air, that it had a history to back it up. He, had, he needed a pedigree or some, some, some sort of uh, to prove that the GD had a legitimate hierarchy or hierarchical succession from some distant authority. Since such, since such no hierarchical authority ever existed for the Golden Dawn. Western Westcott fabricated. He fabricated 
fabricated one. Why did he do this? It was practically the only, the only way he could attract Freemasons, Louis. Freemasons, Rosicrucians, and other serious occultists to his new order. An additional paper, also written in cipher, was initiated or inserted in the manuscript. This was later contained the credentials. He actually had credentials printed and added it of a woman in Germany named Fräulein Sprengel, said to be an adept of an order, a temple and order known as Die Golden Dameron, or the Golden Dawn, through a series of letters, Fräulein Sprengel supposedly authorized Westcott to establish a new temple, a new temple in England, and gave him permission to sign her name on any document that was needed in the spring of 1888, Westcott produced a charter of warrant or warrant for the Isis Urena number no. three of the Order of the Golden Dawn in London. While the cipher manuscripts is genuine, it is certain that Westcott made up the story about Fräulein Sprengel and the letters A.R.A. A. Gilbert has pointed out that the mysterious Fräulein's magical notes and motto, the wise and the rule, the wise shall rule the stars. That was her motto. The wise shall rule the stars was the same model used by another lady called Anna Kingsford, the founder of the Hermetic Society. Kingsford was probably the unsuspected model of Westcott's fabricated Fräulein. Kingsford died in 1888, the year the Golden Dawn was founded, by making Fräulein Sprengel a high-ranking official in an obscure German order, Westcott made her influential, credible, and un unimpreachable. And once the mystical German Sorer had served her purpose, she conveni con conveniently died. So he was off the hook, so to speak. The three founders, anyway, of the Golden Dawn. Once Westcott had fleshed out the rich ritual orders of the cipher manuscripts, he needed help in getting his new order off the ground. One of Westcott's colleagues in the task was Dr. William Robert Woodman, a retired physician, a respected Freemason and member of the SRIA. He served as the editor for the Society of the Journal, the Rosicrucians. When Robert Wentford Little, the founder of the SRIA, died in 1878, Woodman became the Supreme Magus and exported it as influence to, the Aust uh, his influence to Australia and America. It quickly became the world's premier Rosicrucian society. Woodman's was created adding among Kabbalistic emphasis to the students of the SRAA. On the three finding members of the Golden Dawn, the true magician of the order was Samuel Liddell Mather McGregor. Like the others, he was highly ranking, a highly ranking Freemason and a member of the SRAA. Among the three founders, Mathers had been the most criticized and most admired. Both views are often the mark. For Mathers was neither a, a villain nor a superhuman god, but he was one of the more colorful characters in the history of the Golden Dawn, displaying many, many of the assets and liabilities 
associated with those who preserve great genius and creativity. He was quite a genius in his work. But one of the bad things, he was poor and desolate. He didn't have any money. So consequently, he lived off of a lot of people. So I guess maybe that's why he had a lot of time to write these rituals and, and do an exploration and teachings and study. Mathers was a silent ritualist and despite, and despite the fact that he often lived in poverty, he produced some of the finest teachings in the Western esoteric tradition. However, he was capable of being an, an, eccentric, an eccentric tyrant. He was a tyrant. As a practical magician, Mathers had few equals. Of the three four founding members, Mathers was the primary chief of the inner order. He made the Golden Dawn into a truly magical initiatory order, lifting it miles above the occult study societies in the time, at the time. Together, Westcott, Mathers, and Woodman became a triad known as the greatly honored chiefs of the order. The Isis Urena Temple, number three, in London, was inaugurated in February of 1888, and the Golden Dawn was born. By the end of the 1888s, the Isis Retemple Temple had 32 members, three, nine women and 23 men. During its recent and most active period from 1888 to 1903, other temples were established, including the Osiris Temple in the west, in the western, west, western Supermar, the Horus Temple in Bradford, the Amon Ra Temple in Edinburgh, and the Ahathor Temple in Paris. Over the period of time, the order to, stimulated and initiated approximately 350 people, one third of whom were women, as the original order. One third of these students advanced beyond the or outer order grades of the Golden Dawn to become members of the inner college. And I must confess that we as Golden Dawn have been working with the Golden Dawn over 40 years here in the United States. And we have achieved much more and with many made probably thousands of initiates in our order. So uh, we've taken it a step further. And uh, as I look out in the audience, uh, I see a lot of uh, Masons. And most of our, our uh, members are Masons, and uh, Masons, active Masons. So it, it, it works. It's just one of those things that works. Is it doesn't influence. One of the things is to keep, you have to keep these things separate. You can't be mixing them. You keep them separate. When I, when I go and I go to the Masonic Lodges and, and whatever I'm participating in the York Rite or whatever, at that particular time, I am the York Rite and I am a Mason. When I go in the Golden Dawn Temple, I'll wear the Golden Dawn. You have to make a distance between these different initiatory groups. If you try to mix them together, you get nothing but gook. I don't know how else to explain it. I'm a Mason first. Over the period of time, how was the great uh, the Golden Dawn structured? Ah, how was it structured? Like Freemasonry, the Golden Dawn took advantage of the traditional Western Lodge tradition and the Lodge systems. 
The large system can be described as a kind of template which had been used by the wide variety, a variety of fraternal orders, societies, and social clubs. Within the template, a lodge is a group of people who organize and perform initiations. Now, the word initiation means beginning. Initiation, the beginning. The beginning of a journey. It is a ceremony process by producing a specific change in the human consciousness. The alchemists, magicians, and mystics saw in the Masonic tradition, in this Masonic initiation, an echo of the mystery, of the mystery religions of the ancient world, as well as a powerful, powerful tool for magical work. Magicians often describe the process of initiation in terms of charging, charging a talisman, where something that is sta static and lifeless is consecrated and given life, getting a piece of nothing and making it real, making it mean something to you. You bring life to it, and only you could do it. And nobody's going to believe you, so it really doesn't matter. Only it matters to you. So you bring it, you put the energy into it, it becomes yours, put it in your pocket, wear it around your neck, whatever. The physical space of any lodge style group is very similar. The room is rectangular, usually often from the east to the west, with a door in the west between the lodge room and the end chamber. A guard stands watch in the west, and the officers sit in various stations around the lodge room. Members sit in the north and in the south. The officers in the east and west represent an important polarity of the opposite of opposites, excuse me, usually light and darkness, light and darkness. In the Golden Dawn, these officers are named other officers from the ancient Greek mysteries, religion. In the East is the Hierophant, which means the initiating priest, and in the West is the Heros, which means the priest. The middle of the room contains symbolism and important to the group such as an altar. In the group's dawn, the center of the golden dawn, the center of the room also contains a third officer known as the hegemon, meaning guide, who meditates between light and darkness, providing a balanced middle pillar between them. The concept of the time is also defined within the large system. Smooth transitions from one part, one part of the ritual to the next mark periods of times during which ordinary consciousness shifts to the ritual consciousness and back again again opening invocations initiations advancements into the different grades degrees of grades and designs golden dawn ritual openings indicate a banishing a banishing ritual which works to cleanse the area of unwanted energies that would disturb the ceremony. So you do an opening and you do a banishing ritual. You cleanse the room. You make sure there's no en en enemies or en entities there that you don't want. How many times have you gone into the room, the, the lodge, and everybody feeling good and something goes goofy? And you go, something happened. And you don't know what it is and everybody gets in a bad mood or something like that. You kick them out. You kick that energy out of the room. Kick them out. In order, thank you. I do need this. 
Thank you, Lynn. In order to understand the <clears throat> nature of the initiation into the grades of the Golden Dawn, it's important to know something about the principles that system is founded upon. The basic philosophy behind the grade system is the Kabbalah, a Hebrew mystical system that describes the cosmos and includes knowledge of the universe, fundamental essence, structure, and revolution. Excuse me, evolution. Israel Rigardi, I don't know how, if you remember him. He was a great Masonic teacher, and well, Rosicrucian teacher, stated that the Kabbalah is a trustworthy guide leading to a comprehension of the universe and the one self. And one self, by studying the Kabbalah, you could start to understand yourself because the Kabbalah represents you. It means something to you. I wish I had time. Uh, maybe in some other time, I would just love to go through the teachings with you. But this is just an introduction. The main structure of the Kabbalah is the tree of life. Now, I know you've heard of the tree of life. An archetypal pattern that is the model for which the existence it is composed of ten levels of emanations, known as sephiroth, represented by the ten circles of the sphere or spheres. Each sephira represents one specific divine attribute or level of consciousness. The paths that connect them are the roads we can take to arrive at these different art levels. The grades of the golden dawn correspond to the Sephiroth on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. These grades also have elemental and planetary attributions. They are further divided into some separate groups known as the First Order. First or Outer Order of the Golden Dawn. The Second Order. Fraters. The second order is the RRFAC, the red rose in the frost of gold. This is where you start to do Masonic ritual work, the teachings. You have built a foundation, and the foundation is not built on sand, it's solid rock. So when you move forward, you move steadfast. The grades of the golden dawn correspond to the spirit of the Kabbalistic tree of life. These grades also have elemental, planetary attributions. They are further divided into three separate groups known as the first outer order of the golden dawn, the second, or inner order of the RRAC. And the third order, or invisible order, which is non-physical and cannot be obtained by living initiates. Although recently we've had people claiming to be of the third order, which can be very funny. I sometimes ask them, are you alive? You know, they walk around with their heads high. And uh, if actually, if they're in the third order, they shouldn't be walking. So anyway, this grade structure is based upon that of the SRIA. Through that state, state back, had had the system used by the German Rosicrucian Lodges of the 18th century and can be found in Kenneth Mackenzie's Royal Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. All this, what I've been talking about, is in 
Kenneth Mackenzie's Royal Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Some of you probably have skipped over it. And sometimes I don't blame you, but sometimes this time, take a look at it. There are numbers attached to each grade, such as the neophyte is the zero equals zero, Zalater, one equal 10, Thearchus, two equal nine, and so on, and so on, and so on. The first number is rep represents the number of the steps of the initiation symbolical taken on the tree of life. The second refers to the number of the sephira on the tree of life. And it represents the grade. The lowest grade also corresponds to the element, while the higher grade are attributed to the planets and the higher celestial forces. The image of the square and the circle are placed around these numbers to remain in the, to remind the initiates that the quest for spiritual growth is not easy. The request for spiritual growth is not easy. I wanted to repeat that. The golden dawn is organized as a hierarchy system. The outer order is headed and directed by three individuals known as the greatly honored chiefs of the order who govern as a triad. Besides their administrative duties, the greatly honored chiefs take on the god forms of certain Egyptian deities and acts as magical batteries that mediate between the inner plain contacts of the third order and the second and the first. The names of the three chiefs are in Latin. The imperator, which means commander or leader. The premonstrator, meaning one who prophesizes. And the cancellarius or chancellor, who is in charge of the written record and communications. In the outer hall, the ritual work is carried out by the three officers, aired mentioned. The Hierophant, the Hieros, and the Hagman, who preside over the dawning light of the, in the east, the twilight of the west, and the middle pillar, or the middle path, balanced between them. Outer officers include the Kerix, or the, the herald, he, he who makes announcements and leads movement around the hall. Purification and con consecrations are carried out by the Stolistes and the Dodahos, which, re which represent the uh, elements of water and fire. The Phylix, or Sentinel, guards the outer hall. It all sounds familiar, doesn't it? Finally, the presiding officers of the previous term, the past hierophant, is seated on the dais among with the greatly honored chiefs. The outer officers are appointed to serve in their offices by six, for six months, from equinox to equinox. The equinoxes were chosen because they are a time of perfect balance between day and night, or the the imposing forces of light and dark. The arrival of the equinox is marked with a special ritual in which the opening and the outgoing officers relinquish their, their stations in magical regalia, and the newly appointed officers are installed. The temp temple is magically reconsecrated, and the members are given a new password for the following the semester. Just as in masonry, one of the ma major goals of the Golden Dawn Temple is to confer initiation and pass the teachings, pass the teachings out to the next generation of initiates. Since both groups follow the traditional lodge system, 
They both use a similar overall pattern and type of teachings to confer initiation. Candidates are placed in a respective or receptive state by various methods such as hoodwinks and binding ropes. Blindfolded, they are led around the, the hall as a, an experience which puts them in puts them off balance and heightens awareness. Deliberate, carefully concealed shocks such as loud noises or sudden involvements add to the element of surprise and, and make a discomfort to in intensify the in initiatory experience. It startles them. It, it makes them aware of the, where, where they are in the east and it makes them aware they're going in the west. They can't see anything. As a high point in the, the initiation, the presiding officer s confers an oath, an oath of secrecy, which the candidate repeats. After this, different officers confer various points of knowledge to the candidate, such as the password, grip, and sign of that degree, information that guarantees admission into the hall in the future. Beyond that, these signs and symbols will act as a trigger, as triggers that will reference the memory of that health self first initiation and its a sense of intense enlightenment. It does get dry. Brothers, the initiation ceremonies of the Golden Dawn are based on a series of mystery plays, a ritual drama where the officer creates a spiritual figure or a drama, where the officers separate and recreate spiritual legends that are essential to the Western esoteric tradition. In the neophyte ceremony, the ritual narrative concerns the Egyptian story of the weighing of the soul in the trial of judgment. In the great of Zelata, the dogma centers on the Hebrew tabernacle, the Hebrew tabernacle of the West wilderness. Other grades focus on the Yahweh, the conquering, the sea, and the biblical account of the fall of the king of e kings of Edom. The legend of the ancient Greeks are included, as in the Samothracian mysteries. Of the Kabiri, in the second, second order, the primary theme is the allegory of the Christian Rosenkreutz and the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. Sometimes a particular legend is explained to the candidate while uh, being acted out as a Zalater ceremony as other times the legend is in enacted on a purely magical and physical level without the knowledge of the candidate as in the, the, the uh, neophyte ceremony. Whether or not the candidate is made aware of the narrative and drama Underline the trial or the actual ritual. Every indi indication or initiation is the focus of the material cooperation of the astral light. I'm running out of steam. <laughs> Intended to do the help the candidate into the into his his or her quest for the spiritual growth. In one respect, the candidate has a new talisman to purify and consecrate to the divine power. In the neophyte ceremony, the offers invoke the supreme light, the, le the, le the temple, and work to implant the light into the candidate's aura. In the grades that follow, the officers invoke the divine energies associated with the four elements 
of earth, air, water, and fire into the candidate's aura in order to affect the balance and integration. Finally, in the portal initiation, the ceremony, ceremony, the crowning element of spirit is added like capstone that seals the presence of elementary unity. Yod, hey, Vav, hey, and then you add spirit, and the word then becomes Yeheshua, which means Jesus in Hebrew. So it becomes very, very serious. To be clear, the first order of the Golden Dawn does not teach practical magic. Its conferred initiation and provided instruction in the basics of Kabbalah, Tarot, Astrology, and Magical sim Symbolism. In, the, in its regards, it was not very often other orders at the time, but when the second or inner order order was established in 1891, the Golden Dawn became the sometimes greater. It was written the order of the Rose Ruby at Horie Crucis, or the order of the Red Rose and the Golden Cross, whether the initiates move from the philosophy to, pr to practical. They were expected to study and manifest the various aspects of the religious achievements of knowledge at the Golden, at the golden uh, Dawn system. In what, what, in what ones the Golden Dawn teach at one's Golden Dawn magical em 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 implores, explores the fundamental, the fundamental relationship between the humanity and the divine. It expresses vital knowledge of that inner self that is for, forever installed and linked with the sacred source of the ultimate, ultimate unity. One of the things that I insist on uh, as a group, we become one. Unity, unity is the most important thing because in all our teachings, we are teaching you to become unified with your body and your mind, to become one, so that you can be that intellectual as well as a spiritual. This is so important, and it's, sometimes it's missed in other bodies. To the outside, some of these methods might not appear to promote the quest for the divine light. For example, magical creates, magicians create talismans for a whole host of reasons. The Jupiter talisman are often created by magicians who feel the need for the monetary resources. They are looking for money, so they make a Jupiter talisman. And Libra talismans have been created to help resolve Resolve so, some many might wonder how a performing a tarot reading could possibly advance one's union with the divine. To critics of magic, these objects, objective terms are self-centered. The key to, the, the, to these workings is eternal ethical conscious motivation or interpretation. Western magicians view magic as an active rather than a math passive proceeding for something, sometimes spiritual growth. Skilled magicians are able to build an image of the goal in the astral light, just as skilled engineers are able to craft a blueprint of either engines from the, in their imagination. What is that? What is first imagined can be 
created. Theurgy or God working. Theurgy or God working. Uh, ass assisted by meditation and other ritual exercises. Set the count groundwork for the higher awareness and the, the act of union while the, the divine, the talisman, consecration, and, and the similar workings are methods for training. Training the mind to word. I'm getting tired. I'm going to have to go to the end. Now, the second order of the RRAC members were expected to put all. Would you put the slide of the ball pit? This is the slide of the ball to the adepti. When you reach the second order, you will enter this room and you will have the knowledge. By then, you will have been taught the knowledge to work and be part of it. beautiful room is a stillness. When you're in there, you can meditate. You could have an experience that is unbelievable. The colors are flashing. What? Come back to the mic. Oh, come back to the mic. Oh, okay. The, uh, excuse me, I did, I, went, I walked away. I wandered. But the room is quiet and relaxing. And you could do meditation in there. Such a fire existed, extending through the rushing of air, or even a fire formless when the comes the image of a voice, a bounding, revolving, whirling forth, crying aloud. The priest and the priesthood, who needed to give us the water to the fire must sprinkle with the lustral waters of a loud resounding sea. Such a fire existed extending through the rushing of air or even a fire formless whence cometh the image of a voice a bounding, revolving, whirling forth crying aloud. Brothers, stoop not down into that darkly splendid world for continually lieth a faithless death and wrapped in gray dawn, delighting in unintelligible images, precipitous, winding, a black ever rolling abyss, ever espousing a body unluminous, formless, and void. And I say to you, and I say to all of you that have gone through this and listened unto thee unto thee so wise so eternal and so merciful won by thy praise and the glory forever we had permitted permitted me who now standeth humbly before thee to enter into the far, into the sanctuary of thy mysteries, not unto me, but unto thee, thy name be the glory. Let the influence of the divine ones descend upon my head and teach me the value of self-sacrifice so that I shrink not in the labor, in the hour of trial. Let thy name be written on high, and my genius may stand in the presence of the holy ones. In that hour when the Son of Man is involved before the Lord of Spirits, and his name is presented, of the ancient 
the Ancient of Days. Fiat lux, fiat lux, let there be light. I thank you. Brethren, we're going to take uh, a few minutes break. Please be back. It is at this time um, 10.58. If you can be back at 11.05, please, in seven minutes. Thank you.
we, we, we should talk sometime. Yeah, absolutely. I think we should. Yeah. We, uh, I'm on my order in for you. So mm -hmm. we're on the way uh, on the way back here. All right, Gabriel. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you should explain to sit down. Explain to the guys down Thanks, the street. Yeah, I mean, it's always good. <laughs> oh, it looks like me. <laughs> well, it's like when, it, like you know, when when, when you buy a suit, the coffee shop. Yeah, but yeah. on the other hand, there is so much. You have to actually sit there as a pitch yeah. and undo the whole pitch. <laughs> yeah, that's right.
brethren, we're going to go ahead and start again. If you please can take your seat. Brother Eric, are we back? Eric, are we back streaming? Thank you so much. Right. Brethren, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our second speaker for today. Um, Brother Pierce A. Vaughan was born in Brighton, England, and attended Brighton College as well as Oxford and Cranfield Universities. He was an avid musician, singing in a local church, playing several instruments, conducting and composing. He was also a keen fencer and enjoyed appearing in local plays. He even appeared as an extra in Star Wars and uh, Quadrophenia. He received an MA in psychology before going on to complete an, an MBA and later an MA in divinity. Then worked in international banking in England, Germany, and Switzerland before settling in the United States in 1994. His Masonic membership began in England in 1979 where he joined a number of orders prior to joining St. John's Lodge No. 1 Ancient York Masons in New York, where he has served twice as its masters and has traveled extensively with the Lodge treasure, President George Washington's uh, inaugural Bible. So for those of you who do not know, St. John's Lodge holds and keeps the Bible of President and Brother George Washington, and uh, I know that um, it has traveled to many jurisdictions for many Masons who have taken their oath and obligation on it, whether when becoming a grand officer or even a master of the lodge. You'll see him later to get more details on that after this presentation. Um, he's given talks on, on that subject in a number of states. He was Grand High Priest of New York State in 2014, and is Grand First Ancient in the SCRICF, a 33rd degree ancient and accepted Scottish Rite Mason, and has served in the East for the majority of Masonic bodies that he belongs to. He has traveled extensively across the United States and in many countries abroad, giving lectures on subjects ranging from history to symbolism and esotericism in Freemasonry. He has had papers published by the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rites Southern Masonic Jurisdiction, journal the, the journal, journal, the Plum Line, the SRICF Fama, and the Masonic Study Society, among others. An interest in 18th century French Masonic ritual uh, has also led him to translate a number of important treaties and rituals into English. In 2019, he was inducted into the Society of Blue Friars, a prestigious invitational society which recognizes published Masons. He is also very involved in a number of orders outside of Freemasonry, predominantly ones which he are descended from European esoteric groups, and is also patriarch of the apostol uh, Apostolic Church um, of the Gold and Rosy Cross, a church descended from the pre-Nicene Church of Richard, Duke of Palatine. He also possesses lines from the Order of Pleroma, a group of pan-Sophic rites handed down from John Yarker, and is also National Grand Aster for the Martinist Order of Unknown Philosophers, MOUP. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce Brother Pierce Vaughn. Good morning. Well, in our first talk uh, by uh, Chick Cicero, we heard a lot about the uh, development of uh, parallel esoteric orders in England. Uh, for my talk with Martinism, we're going to kind of flop across the channel and uh, visit France for a bit. 
Now, in this talk, we'll explore the Masonic roots of the founders of the Gnostic, magical, and mystical currents, which gave rise to the extraordinary outpouring of Masonic ritual in the late 18th century in France, and how this current was taken up again at the end of the 19th century by a new generation of seekers of light. During that extraordinary period, which saw the rise of the Golden Dawn, as we've heard, spiritualism, the Gnostic Church, theosophy, and the Masonic Rosicrucian bodies, alongside rapid developments in science, and how those pioneers attempted to reconcile these two streams. But while we'll examine the history and purpose of Martinism, it's not intended to be a lesson in its teachings. That'll be a subject for another day. But first, as Chick did in this first talk, a few definitions. I've used the terms Gnostic, magical, and mystical. Let's briefly examine what we mean by these terms, which are not often heard in what we might call Anderson or Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry. Gnosticism is a spiritual movement, most often associated with Christianity, but drawing from other classical sources which existed alongside what we might now term Catholic or Orthodox Christianity in the centuries immediately following the life of Jesus of Nazareth. They tended to take a far more esoteric approach to the teachings of Jesus, suggesting that there was a hidden or inner church only available to initiates, and that the Church of St. Peter was really an exoteric church. Following the Emperor Constantine's conversion to Christianity, a highly political council called the Council of Nicaea was held in what is now Turkey in 325 of the Common Era, and that was to determine the dogma of this new church. However, the manner in which it was held made it next to impossible for most of the Gnostic-leaning bishops, most of whom came from the north, north coast of Africa, to attend the key votes, such as the nature of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, and most important, which of the many, for there are over 30 Gospels in circulation at the time, would be considered canonical or official, and as we know, they whittle the 30 or so down to four. As a result, the four Gospels we now recognize were selected, and over the following two centuries, any variations to these were ruthlessly persecuted, hunted down, and destroyed, often along with their preachers. The only reason we have access to most of the so-called forbidden Gospels is thanks to a small group of monks who disagreed with that high-handed approach and buried their alternative teachings in pots near Nag Hammadi to be discovered just under a century ago. We should note at the outset that all three of the protagonists we're going to talk about shortly, Pasquale, Willemose, and Saint Martin, believed that the church of the 18th century was irretrievably corrupt and ineffectual, and they believed that true initiation came from the primitive or pre-Nicene church, which existed before that group of men had overtaken God's message by a series of very human votes. This primitive church, at once directly linked to Jesus himself and Gnostic in outlook, was for them the source of all valid initiation. As for magical and mystical, I hope everyone realizes, as Chick said, magic refers to the ability to affect physical laws through the use of paranormal powers, rather than the ability to do clever card tricks. And magic comes in various types and definitions, ranging from low, or the ability to affect minor temporal things, too high or theurgical, the ability to communicate with higher powers, usually angels. Mystical, for our purposes, refers to the ability to achieve union with divinity through self-surrender and contemplation, which is a rather different path to that of magic, in which the perpetrator is active rather than passive in these attempts. In England, while it was very clear that Freemasonry existed long before 1717, in that year the Premier Grand Lodge of England was founded. Why? Well, one of the strongest theories is because the Masons had to show a complete break with their former organization, which had been strongly Stuartist, and therefore Jacobite. In order to survive the change of monarchy to King George I, they literally had to reinvent themselves. Within a generation, a close relative of the monarch was the Grand Master, and any pretense to earlier organizations, including Rosicrucianism, Templarism, or anything which could be seen as Catholic or interpretative, and therefore subversive of Protestantism, was expunged. 
or at least for a time. Europe was a very different matter. While the former strength of the Roman Catholic Church had largely prevented rival bodies from being formed and sovereign powers had prevented groups from meeting in private to discuss matters of national importance, the arrival of the Age of Enlightenment blew most of the cobwebs away. And even the exiled English Catholic monarch, King James II, saw an opportunity to harness the energy of this romantic movement to his advantage. Indeed, with the weakening of the church's stranglehold over everything and the diminishing of the monarchical power, the last potential bastion against the Neo-Templar movements, which were springing up everywhere at the time, had been removed. Instead of meeting in Protestant countries or in secret, many of those were now absorbed into Freemasonry, and their traditional motto or password of Nekan, which means vengeance, could now be openly cried out. But vengeance against whom? Well, the stated aim of the Neo or New Templars was the restoration of their honor and wealth across Europe, and also the demise and even the death of the Pope and the King of France for the roles they played in the execution of Jacques de Millet. And, of course, we know the King of France has presided over the destruction of the order and the brutal extermination of its members purely out of greed and to avoid having to repay debts. So the stage was set in Europe for an explosion of Masonic orders, which absorbed Templarism and chivalry in general, Rosicrucianism and any esoteric current they could find, including Kabbalah, alchemy, Gnosticism, ancient Greek and Roman mystery schools, and even ancient Egypt. Indeed, it's perhaps surprising to find that in an order which housed some of the keenest Enlightenment ritual minds, currents of magic and theurgy or angelic communication could still be found alive and well. Given that mainstream Freemasonry was itself used by some of the earliest stories from the Old Testament as its vehicles for teachings, all this actually fitted right in. Now, what makes an esoteric order then? Well, to better understand the importance of these currents, we should consider some of the key credentials which these bodies, including Freemasonry, need to show in order to exist and to attract members. So firstly, we need a valid or perceived transmission from ancient times. And Chick told us about the way that uh, William and Westcott fabricated Anna Sprengel to create this kind of veneer of respectability going back to the distant past. We need rituals which are impressive and education and powerful. We need secret teachings in an order which could be studied in private and not available to the profane. We need some kind of purpose, a belief system. It could be a dogma or a creed or just a philosophical system or even an outlook on man's purpose on this planet. And ultimately it must be adaptable since absolute teachings, despite the fundamentalist dogmas of all religious minorities, must adapt to survive the changes in living standards, worldview, education, and man's own evolution. Now, to this list for esoteric orders, I would add a direct link with the past masters. And you can spell that either way, either past P-A-S-T or past P-A-S-S-E-D. Or possibly even the presence of an eminence grise, often referred to as an unknown superior, or superior inconnu. And thus we find, when we look to Germany at that time, in the order of strict observance of Baron von Hund, attracting the aristocracy and monarchs alike with its claims both to direct links with the Templars and communications with secret chiefs, which appear somewhere between the English monarchs in exile or maybe even angelic beings. And thus we find Chevalier Andrew Ramsey giving his famous oration in 1737 in France, which gave rise to the legend of Freemasonry's direct descent from the Knights Templar, their involvement in the battles of Robert the Bruce in Scotland against the English, and their founding of Freemasonry there in the 14th century. And to quote part of his oration, he says, Yes, sirs. The famous festivals of Ceres at Eleusis, of Isis in Egypt, of Minerva at Athens, or Urania among the Phoenicians, or Diana and Scythia were connected with our Freemasonry. In those places, mysteries were celebrated which concealed many vestiges of the ancient religion of Noah and the patriarchs. 
Seeing an advantage in living up to his reputation as Grand Master of all Masons, King James II and his son eagerly signed Masonic warrants and charters in France and encouraged the spread of this initially chivalric fashion, seeing in it a means to obtain the loyalty and hopefully the financial and arms-bearing support of its members and the French aristocracy. But for all this, as history has obviously shown us, the hoped for retaking in England never took place in his lifetime, and the efforts of his offspring, the young and old pretenders, amounted to epic failures. However, all these warrants and charters circulating in France, and again, just to remind us, uh, this is why they were called Ecosse charters, because they were mainly signed by King James II and his son, James Stuart. Ecosse, of course, translated means Scottish. So whenever we hear the word Scottish right, it actually refers to the rights in France. Nothing doing with Scotland, because the king was exiled by then. So more properly, they should have been really called the French right rather than the Scottish right, but as we all know, the word Scottish is stuck. So all these circulation of warrants and charters in France, of all these warrants, none was more mysterious, perhaps, and which still provokes fascination and intrigue among Masons, than that allegedly awarded in 1738 to the father of a certain Martinez Pasquale, containing powers to establish lodges, as well as the pastor's authority onto his son. Now, little is truly known about the background and origins of Martinez Pasquale, the enigmatic mason. In the past, there's been much speculation on whether he was French or Spanish, or whether he was even descended from a Jewish family. Modern research suggests he was, in fact, a French Catholic, spoke French fluently, but not so good at writing it, and that his occult knowledge came from study and perhaps membership in other secret orders. For 20 years, from 1754 to 1774, he ruled as Grand Sovereign over his own order, called the Ordre des Chevaliers Maçons et le Cohen de l'Univers, or Knight Masons, Elect Cohen of the Universe, more commonly referred to nowadays as the Elu Cohen, or Elect Cohens. Now, the Kohenim were the priests in the Torah officially commissioned by Yahweh to officiate at religious ceremonies, and by implication, to have direct communication with higher powers. He based his system on the new Scottish Rite, then developing in Bordeaux, where he also had several lodges, many with the same members as in the Scottish lodges. However, his system of somewhere between nine and 11 grades was comprised of far more complicated rituals his order was more a way of life, requiring extensive private study, the setting up of a private oratory, following a rigorous and essentially vegetarian diet, and the recital of the prayers four times a day. Now, while the meetings were actually regularly held for advancement and instruction, most of the operative or magical work in his order was done alone at home. And this included the drawing of magic circles, invoking angelic forces, and twice a year at the equinoxes, even summoning demonic powers in order to exorcise them. Thus, he considered his order to be an active priesthood. Once the practitioners had received certain signs, which he called la chose, which is French for the thing, this allowed members to identify their own personal guardian angel and to work with them on their individual advancement. Needless to say, this process could take many years and was certainly not for the faint-hearted. However, the key to this work was its context. While masonry is not normally seen as being a religion, in the case of the Order of Elu Cohen, it was as close as one could come to it. The work was based on an extraordinary work developed by Pasquale and dictated to his secretary, Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, a work which was nothing less than a Gnostic commentary on the Holy Bible. Just as entire branches of the Christian religion have been based on one man's interpretation of the scriptures, so this extraordinary book, called the Treatise on the Reintegration of Beings into their Primitive or Original Estate, was essentially a Christian Zohar. And like that mysterious book which appeared in Spain around the 13th century, was a mystical commentary on the biblical stories. Like the Kabbalah or Hebrew mysticism, it relies heavily on numerology and ascribes great importance to the first ten numbers, to the extent that the angelic names used in its prayers, which are largely based on the Psalms, must correspond to the numbers discovered by the member during his meditations and his private practices. So what was this theory, or this 
did this theology he was preaching. Well, in essence, he said when God created the universe, he placed what could be called angelic forces over it to govern it. But they became prideful, and to use his term, prevaricated, believing themselves to be equal to God. As punishment, God created man to govern the prison in which he now placed him, Earth. For a while, man enjoyed his unique privileges and his Eden being clothed in his glorious non-corporeal body and enjoying direct communication with the Creator. But the evil powers over which he'd been set in charge worked on his pride and persuaded him that he himself was equal to God and capable of creation. Man, or Adam, believing them, then set about working a magical operation to create himself a companion, Hava, or Eve. But he only managed to entangle himself in the very red earth or mud he was using to create this body, thereby confusing his immortal and incorporeal body with this mud, and became a hybrid, an immortal being trapped in matter, no longer capable of direct communication with the higher powers. Well, God saw what Adam had done without his permission, and he completed the act of creation and provided him with his mate, Eve. But as punishment for his enormous crime, he sentenced him to live in this place where over which he had once ruled, but now as one of the material creations which occupied it, and set another agent called Haley, which Samitang equated with the Christ, and also called the Repairer, to rule in his stead until man was able, through his own efforts, to restore himself to his original position of glory. Now, the treatise also indicated that the patriarchs of the Bible, from Adam onwards, worked on their own reintegration and reconciliation with God by performing operations or magical practices, which was the means by which they now had to use in order to communicate with the divine realm. This, of course, was his justification for the elaborate and complex theurgy expected of the members of his order. Man's purpose, therefore, was to first recognize he was indeed an immortal being trapped in matter, to learn to rise up above this and to seek the spiritual in order to realize the ultimate goal of reintegration, both of himself and everything else, back into their original state, thus restoring the original balance of the universe, which was God's creation. Now later, Sam Atan was to phrase this master's teaching in a compelling way, which is very close to the storyline, actually, of that extraordinary movie, hopefully you've seen it, The Matrix. Now if you remember in The Matrix, you remember that uh, Neo was trapped in a little bubble, living a happy, endless dream, until that bubble broke, and then he was like ejected from it, and started to have to wake up and realize that the real world was very, very different to what he'd been exper experiencing in his cocoon. Now, Saint Martin calls men ignorant of his plight and living a daily life of routine a man of the stream, which he describes as caught up in the forest of errors. And again, very much as Chick mentioned in the first speech, this is all of us. We get up, we have breakfast, we go to work, we have lunch, we go to work, we come home, we have dinner, we switch on telly, watch, have a drink, go to bed. And then the next day we do the same thing, and the next day. And the next day, repeat, 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 week after week, month after month, year after year. And a lot of people, believe me, if you look around, can actually get through most of their lives without ever actually waking up. It's, it's like wasting your entire life on autopilot. You only have to collide with people on their iPhones walking around to see that. That is the ultimate kind. To me, that, that's almost the analogy of a zombie nowadays. Somebody walking around glued to an iPhone, oblivious of anything around them. So Sam Anshan's call was, what we have to do is to wake up and see what's really going on in this world. As Shakespeare put in Hammer's Mouth, you know, the idea that there is more to heaven and earth than is dreamt of in thy philosophy, for Horatio. And it often happens when we start to, I, I mean, in my case, it happened when I walked through a park. And I suddenly found myself stopping, and the sun was coming through the trees of, of a tree uh, in spring many years ago. And I suddenly realized that tree was actually beginning to glow. And I, was and I just stared at it. And I could literally see an aura around the tree. And at that moment, suddenly you stop walking just, just as an automaton. And you start to look at people. You look at things. And then you start to realize there is so much more going on around us than just what we see through our usual blind eyes. 
So he called this man a man of desire, somebody who had finally woken up like Neo in the Matrix and was really beginning to see that there was a lot more to God's design going on around us, which normally we just ignore. And then finally, as you start to work on yourself, shedding everything that does not lead to the result of trying to seek reunification or reintegration with God, we become a new man or a new woman. And finally, as we achieve our goal, we once again become spirit man, exchanging the material body, shedding that, and becoming back to regain our glorious body, allowing our immortal souls to shine forth once more, as in our first estate. Now, we must remember this was still a time when Protestant churches, on the one hand, held services lasting several hours, mostly focused on man's impotence, his inevitable sinfulness, and the inevitability of hell, while the Roman Catholic churches used Latin, and the priest mumbled to himself at the far end of the sanctuary while his flock looked on as little more than a passive audience. So this new, dangerous, thrilling Gnostic technology offered the initiate the opportunity to take his salvation into his own hands, forge his own relationships with the superior beings, provided a satisfying explanation for his present estate, and offered a clear means of rising above it, and saving therefore both himself and everyone around him. What was not to love? Except for the extraordinary commitment of time, hardship, and diet. But as often happens with an order founded on personality and which the bulk of knowledge resides in one man alone, the order had little chance of survival once its protagonist and founder, Pasquale, left French source in 1772 to take up an inheritance in Saint-Domingue, now Haiti, dying there in two years later in 1774. By 1778, only eight temples were still in operation in France, and by 1781, Sebastian Las Casas, then the Grand Sovereign of the order, ordered their closure. The order, excepting perhaps a few small groups who probably continued to practice some of the rituals more or less in private, was effectively dead. But as we say about monarchy in England, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. Here the order is dead, but guess what? Long live the order. Well, most people who join organizations tend to be followers, becoming rudderless when their leader leaves or dies. Occasionally, one or more are left behind to have the aspiration and the inspiration to continue the legacy in some form. In this, Pasquale was lucky or clever in selecting two members who were to continue his legacy, albeit in different forms, from that time right up to the present day. These two members were Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin and Jean-Baptiste Willemose. These two came from very different backgrounds. Saint-Martin was a minor aristocracy with an army commission, while Willemose was a silk merchant in Lyon. And they lived in very different parts of the country, almost opposite ends from Bordeaux and, and Lyon, which necessitated long coach drives in those days to come together. Under normal circumstances, there would never been a reason for them to meet. Willemose was from a large family and married, while Samatau was an only child and single. About the only thing they had in common was they were both Freemasons, in itself an oddity since they were a both raised Catholic in a predominantly Catholic country, which in theory still obeyed the edicts of the Pope including the infamous ban on Freemasonry, we all know that one, in Eminentia, which in France, though, for reasons of idleness rather than policy, had never actually been enforced in France. And perhaps this, this coming together of these two people who should never have met is one of those great examples of the Masonic phrase you all know so well, that this noble institution of ours brings together men who might otherwise have remained perpetually at a distance. There is an abundance of biographies on Saint-Martin Pasquale and Willemose, so we'll limit ourselves just to notice that Saint-Martin and Willemose were avid disciples of Pasquale. Indeed, Saint-Martin even gave up his army commission to become Pasquale's personal secretary, while Willemose devoted many years to the practices before finally obtaining his signs and passing to the final grade of Rayo Croix, which note the name is not Rose Croix. Rayo Croix was uh, d actually altogether a different degree. Now, Willemose was an avid Mason, having introduced both a number of orders to Lyon, including von Heitz's right of strict observance, and he wrote a lot of them himself as well, including one called Black Eagle Rose Croix, another Grand Ecossais Trinitaire, and a number of elect Knight Greats. 
From 1775, a year after Pasquale's death, Saint Martin was staying with Willemose at the time, and he wrote his book, first book, of Errors and Truth. He had noticed a darker side to the Enlightenment, and that the scientific advances were leading to some to question even the need for a god, holding that nothing which couldn't be observed could exist. And uh, therefore, if you couldn't observe it and it didn't exist, then how could God exist? And that led Saint Martin to call these people, these representatives of agnosticism and atheism, the observers. Now, towards the end of his association with Pasquale and before he went to Haiti, Saint Martin was beginning to question the need for all the long work and the complicated operations, asking, famously asking him, but Master, is all this truly necessary to know God? Now, once Pasquale departed, in both senses of the word, Saint Martin found himself taking a different approach through the practice of contemplation and meditation. He never departed from his master's somewhat unorthodox theology, but he had embarked on a new and parallel path, which he called the cardiac path, or way of the heart. His books increasingly reflected a more introspective approach, and he initially wrote under the pseudonym of Unknown Philosopher, though it appears his identity was an open secret right from the front, right from the get-go. And interestingly, it was during a two-year period in Lyon, while Saint Martin and Willemos were holding educational classes on Pasquale's teachings of the Elo Cohen in Willemos home from 1774-1776, that Saint Martin read a short paper against the atheistic trends of the Enlightenment, and he was encouraged by his friends to expand it into a book, which ultimately became of errors and truth. This book clearly hit a nerve in France. It was an immediate bestseller among both all the Masons and the intelligentsia. It even earned the grudging respect even of the anti-Masons, one of whom referred to it as, weirdly enough, the Masonic Quran. Now his first book was followed seven years later by another called Natural Table of the Relationships which exist between God, man, and the universe. I mean, the title itself tells us that he was a Mason can see because obviously everything doing masonry how we look to the first three degrees is about our duty to ourselves our duty to our fellow man our duty to god in the meantime john baptist wheelamos was continuing to develop masonic rituals and work with his family and friends one of his younger brothers actually was a alchemist who's uh, pierre jacques who studied in marseille then a center for that kind of study Despite the dawning of the Age of Enlightenment and the focus on science and the creation of world apart from warfare and totalitarian regimes, science was not yet that far advanced. And in the world which is examining the circulation of the blood, it was doing that alongside a belief still in spontaneous generation. And where experiments in electricity and gravity still sat next to the four classical elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And a belief in magic, theurgy, and alchemy was still widespread. Don't forget, until the end of the 19, 1800s, about 90% of people in France were farmers and lived and worked on the fields. There was very, very little industry. And almost all of them believed in early religious practices and superstitions. They had their own little magic they worked. I mean, um, for, I mean, to give you an example, you know, given the fact of the uh, influx of uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Deutsch from Germany to here, so obviously standing in Pennsylvania, if I say powwow to you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that was the kind of belief of the vast majority of people who lived in France right up to 1900, until they really started to reform everything. So that belief in magic and theurgy were still very, very widespread through France, even though the intelligentsia sitting in Paris thinking themselves above all this, the encyclopedists and the others uh, did not believe in that anymore. But Willemot's greatest gift to his work before and following the convent of Wilhelmsbad in 1782, the year that Saint Martin published Natural Table, was an internet, uh, what was, sorry, the convent of uh, Wilhelmsbad. It was an interest, international conference which consolidated various agreements held in 1778. And at that meeting, essentially the right of strict observance was compelled to renounce any claims at all to being run by secret chiefs, effectively neutralizing its most compelling attraction for membership. At the same time, a new order based on the former was established, that of the Scottish Rectified Rite, or the CBCS, which now moved control of one of the most influential rites of masonry out of Germany 
and into France. It's important to state at the outset that the Scottish rectified rite has no connection at all with the ancient accepted Scottish rite, other than the possibility that some of its rituals were penned by former members of the LKOM. Just, it was just that anything that appeared in France at that time was called Scottish, had Scottish somewhere in its title, but there's no other connection. The Masonic system consisted of eight grades divided into three bodies. It's important to realize that while we now know the entire structure of the order, it was not known in those days. The whole structure had only been known to a tiny number of people. And that was because, again, a bit like the Golden Dawn used to be, if you join the Golden Dawn and you're in the Outer Order, it wasn't until you reached a certain point it was revealed to you that there was a second higher order to join. It was the same here. The first degrees were more or less like blue masonry, and when you got there, you might be tapped on the shoulder and said, actually, there are more degrees you can now do. So now we know it all because thanks to Wikipedia and the internet, but in those days, it was a series of veils hiding these three, three levels of this special order. So basically, the second order's existence was only revealed to those to who were selected from the first order, and the third order was only revealed at all to a tiny minority who effectively ruled the entire order. Now, as a reflection of how important this rite was and is in masonry, can be tested to by the fact that Willemo spent the rest of his long life, he lived to about 92, working and reworking these grades in order to produce what could be described as the most sublime manifestation of Freemasonry in its entire history. The rite itself is exoterically Christian, but those who reach its higher grades soon come to realize this ain't the Christianity of Sunday school, and the Gnostic teachings of Pasquale manifest themselves throughout the regime. The rite begins with the blue degrees of enter the apprentice, companion, and master mason, before continuing to a pivot degree of uh, basically Scottish master of St. Andrew, and perfect master of St. Andrew, which is the equivalent, I guess you could say, of the Royal Arch. And that was named St. Andrew in homage to the claim roots of chivalry or Templar masonry in Scotland. Indeed, some of the passwords also link back to Scotland and the Templars. And this grade represents that of the Royal Arch in its imagery. But in this instance, Hiram is not dead, but resurrected as he gazes towards the, the horizon in, the in his cerements, the ruins of his tomb around him, reflecting the ruins of the first temple seen at the start of that degree. The final symbol shown to him is that of a lion sheltering from a storm beneath an outcrop and playing with Masonic implements bearing the motto, Meliora Presumo, or I hope for better things. And indeed, that was the hint that there was another order behind it. And indeed, it was the faith and hope of that candidate that one day he may be allowed to join the second order. So while the existence of the Order of St. Andrew was known to the Blue Lodge Masons, because they came to visit and they wore very different regalia, nothing at all was known of the second order except to its members. Now, once the candidate was invited into the fifth grade, the initiate became a squire novice, a reflection of that period in prayer and meditation experienced of a knight expectant prior to being dubbed a knight beneficent of the holy city of Jerusalem. But this was a spiritual knighthood rather than a warrior knighthood, having more in common with spiritual alchemy than with battle. Indeed, the attentive knight would have detect, uh, detected many trappings of the Gnostic teaching of Pasquale in these grades which were considered the Naples ultra of French and most continental masonry at the time. And yet behind the pinnacle of chivalric masonry, there were yet two more secret grades, those of profess and grand profess, or professed and grand profess knight. It was here that Willemos had concealed the full teachings of Pasquale into two long lectures. And it's almost without doubt, and I've spent many years talking to scholars in France and other countries, and we're all pretty much agree that although no records were ever taken of these meetings, that there is no doubt in our minds the earliest professed knights practiced many of the rituals taught by Pasquale to his Cohen. Because if you look at the records, they were the same people who had been in the Cohen temples before, now turn into the professed and grand professed knights of the Scottish rectified rite. So we have no doubt at all that they were still drawing their magic circles and doing their home rituals and everything else. But it would go against everything we know of Willemos not to believe it was going on. 
For example, only a few years later, in 1783, he became interested in magnetism, which ultimately led to what were essentially the seances being held from 1786 to 1788, where a medium made contact with an entity calling itself the unknown agent, or agent inconnu, and which dictated a large number of teachings. But eventually William Owens himself began to have doubts as to the veracity and ended the meetings of what he had termed the Society of Initiates, eventually destroying most of the readings which they had written down. But we can never underestimate the importance of Willem O's work and the massive impact his regime would have had on masonry if it had come to fruition, and if the French Revolution had not swept its ambitions away. According to Jean-Marc Vivenza, an acclaimed scholar in France on the subject, his ambitions for the right extended far beyond just creating yet another series of Masonic rites. While he, like Saint Martin, was not overly convinced by what he saw as the incredibly complicated preparations for Pasquale's operations, nevertheless, he never questions his theology, and his continuing belief in the ability to communicate with the higher powers clearly shines forth, both in his commitment to the Ella Cohen long after the departure of his master, and also in his later seances in attempting to communicate with the Agent Ancanu. Indeed, one ma major question had always been once Pasquale had departed for Haiti in 1772, why did he decide to bring his lodge, La Bienfaisance, or Beneficent, over to Baron von Hun's right of strict observance? Now, we know from 1774-1776, Willemot Saint-Martin and uh, Roi d'Autrive were together in line and holding meetings in Willemot's house where they discussed Pasquale's teachings. And these were preserved in the famous archives called the Lessons of Lyon. As with all acts, in the absence of their master, they continue to develop their understanding of all these teachings while not losing the Gnostic foundation. And this is important, and we see it happen both in the lessons themselves and in the fact that Saint Martin's first book of Let Errors and Truth, which was locally published, also shows departures in various ways from Pasquale's pure Gnostic thought and becoming considerably more generically Christian. Now, according to Vivenza, Willemos loved the teachings of the Ella Cohen, but found the structure of the order based on the Scottish Rite unsatisfying and very unstable. The fact that most of the rituals were incomplete and the teachings passed by Pasquale were only pass partly available and sometimes almost impossible to understand, um, that didn't help either, obviously. It's hard to t transmit something which isn't complete. So he looked around and found a far more satisfying and stable Masonic structure in the Order of Strict Observance. But while the structure was sound, the purpose most certainly wasn't, because it was preoccupied with re-establishing the Templars, something which is totally irrelevant to Willemos. So with what might be seen as a somewhat ruthless approach, he joins the Order, sets it up in France, and within four years, he organized a convent at which all claims to Templar goals are thrown out the window, all connections with unknown superiors are thrown out the window, and basically he signs a death warrant of the right of strict observance. And then finally changes the name of what's left from Knight Templar to Knight Beneficent of the Holy City. Neatly notice, inserting the name of his own lodge, Beneficence, into the name of the new order. And this was the vehicle by which Willemos could now promulgate the teachings of the Ella Cohen. And just as, oh, uh, just as one example of what he did with the uh, teachings of the strict observance when he brought them to the new order, one of the tracing boards in the strict observance in the first degree is this, ad hoc stat, which is Latin for it still stands. Now, the interpretation in the right of strict observance was that this represents the Templar order, once broken and now without its leader, and now becomes a rep, so that's how they saw it. They just said, oh yes, this is, this is, represents Templary, and uh, the head is gone, Jack de Malay, we need to replace him sort of thing and reestablish ourselves, because the foundation still stands. But in the rectified right, he said, no, this is actually a representation of man whose inner, inner temple has been broken because of his prevarication, and whose celestial part has been thrown into the abyss, and on which he must work in order to rebuild and thus restore himself to his original state of glory. In other words, the complete series of six grades were much, much more than a series of rituals just to teach moral lessons to Masons. They were actually a system of salvation through which, by applying the tools given to him at every grade, and in particular the seven cardinal and theological virtues, 
each man could become a man of desire and ultimately a new man and accomplish reintegration. So it's no surprise that the seventh and eighth grades of the profession, like the perfecti of the Cathars, provided the order's leadership with the unveiled truth of Pasquale's theology, and as I've suggested, quite probably theurgical operations at this level to accompany those teachings. So remember that this conference of Gaul and Wilhelmsbad in 1782 weren't local affairs. They were major Masonic conferences attended by the leaders right across the whole of Europe, mainland Europe, at least not England, but mainland Europe at the time. The intention of all these leaders from Germany, from uh, Sweden, from Denmark, from Italy, from France, was to create once and for all one single comprehensive Masonic system. And Willemos made sure he was there at its center, its organizer, its advisor, its scribe, and even the author of the rituals. Had his vision succeeded and the French Revolution not taken place, the rectified right might have become the face of Freemasonry throughout most of the world. Indeed, Robert Ambelin claimed in 1948 in his pamphlet Contemporary Martinism that the only truly credible line of initiation from the Cohen which survives to modern times is that which was passed through the profession of the Scottish rectified right. Now, in the meantime, Saint Martin had been attracting quite a following with the publications of his books, and it's very clear he had a close-knit group with whom he worked, which unusually for the times also included a large number of women. And this was a century before the Golden Dawn. There had been considerable speculation whether he belonged to a secret society prior to his involvement with this. Uh, but unless some definitive proof comes up, it seems unlikely, since he had such a busy schedule. It's very, very hard to know if he would have had time to do this. So to summarize the first flurry, flourishing of what is called Martinist ideas, and this is where Martinism really comes from, and it's named for two people. It's named for saint Martin, and it's also named for Martinez de Pasquale. So over time, people started to talk about Martinism and Martinezism, and finally got rid of the es because it was too complicated to say, and just grouped both together, and these teachings as the foundation of Martinism. So to summarize, this first flourishing of Martinist ideas, if Pasquale had been the magician or the magus, then Saint Martin must have been the mystic and Willemos the mason. Or again, in Masonic terms, you could say Pasquale was the prophet, Saint Martin the priest, and Willemos the king. Curiously, their three different leanings brought three different approaches to the same message. And this is why the term Martinism has often been applied to all three approaches the magical Elu Cohen, the mystical Mar Christian Martinist order, and the Masonic Scottish rectified rite, all contain the same teachings, but fitted in a way for different audiences. However, all this was to be blown away by an extraordinary event which almost none had foreseen, so it was right on top of them, the French Revolution. This brought everything to a complete grinding halt. Both the Saint Martin, who was a minor aristocrat and therefore actually thrown in jail for a period, and Willemos, uh, who during the Siege of Lyon actually lost his younger brother, um, yep, there we have the Siege of Lyon, lost his younger brother to the guillotine, and he was only spared by a fluke. He was actually in jail awaiting execution by the guillotine when the night before he was due to be executed, the French Revolution faded and fizzled out in Lyon, and he was actually set free. He was literally 12 hours from death, a rather nasty one, I think. Now, at this point, it's perhaps interesting to note the cyclical nature of things, especially referred to as fin de siècle, or end of century feeling. Man appears to be very open to a global ending to life, perhaps reflecting his personal fear of death and the unknown, remembering that even the early Christians believed that the end of the world would appear in their lifetimes and Christ would come back in glory to judge the quick and the dead. And a thousand years later, the Christian, as the Christian calendar ticked over to four figures in the, in the year 1000 AD, dire predictions of world-ending catastrophes were commonplace. Indeed, the end of almost every century has been open to such claims of end times. If they didn't take place, can any religious leaders simply move the dates or claim that some magnanimous act of personal piety had saved everyone on the planet? A theme common to all this note is exclusion. The idea that 
only the adherents of a particular cult would be saved, an idea which has been embraced by groups as diverse as Jehovah's Witnesses and their uh, limited seating arrangements, the Mormons who created additional scriptures to support their claims, and of course some groups of evangelicals who invented an event not even found in the scripture called the rapture, but which still contains that same familiar theme that only they go to heaven, while everyone else goes through a horrible series of terrible sufferings. In fact, in England we used to uh, tell a joke, uh, sort of, uh, that uh, basically uh, a man died and he went to heaven and uh, Jesus is showing him around heaven and, sh and it's, oh, this is such a wonderful place. And he looks at the brooks and the people, everyone is so happy, everyone is glowing, it's the perfect afterlife. And they cross the brow of a hill and he suddenly sees this area which is like walled off. And he looks at us and he turns to Jesus and says, what's that? And Jesus replies, oh, that's the Jehovah's Witnesses. They like to think they're the only people up here. Compare these ideas which are whole, but these ideas are wholly alien to most religions. And we can see why then the concept of a personal salvation and the duty to work towards the rescue of others and the uplifting belief that everyone contains a spark of the divine and can be aspired to be one with and like God. And we can quickly understand why Gnostic teachings such as those professed by the Cohen and Martinism would hold so much attraction. Indeed, one thing common to all so-called esoteric orders, which seem to rise up and flourish at the end of each century at a time of fear and uncertainty, is that they all offer the individual to place control into his or her hands, be it through efficacious prayer, communication with higher powers, or even controls over the laws of physics on our own planet. While it is easy to pick any war to prove a point, Given that mankind is so often engaged in territorial land grabs or the confiscation of scarce resources, which, despite all protestations of moral value and inherent right, are really the only two real reasons we ever go to war, if we focus on the last three cycles or centuries, we will see a repeating pattern. Now, towards the end of the 18th century, the Western world was alive with potential and possibilities. Science was evolving rapidly, yet its apparent rejection of the spiritual, as we saw, led to a resurgence of mystical and magical orders. And all this came crashing down due to the revolution, and in the teens of the 19th century, due to man-made wars, and Americans should remember that 1812 in Europe was not remembered because of the Anglo-American War, but rather because of Napoleon's failed attempt to invade Russia. And these were followed by the Napoleonic Wars, the Hundred Days War, all of which involved most of Europe. So the idea of most of Europe being at war is nothing new. And at the end of the 19th century, therefore, as a kind of counter to all this, we saw a similar rise in scientific advancement and the industrial era at its height, balanced by a resurgence of interest in the occult, as seen in everything from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the Theosophical Society, the rise of Masonic Rosicrucian Orders, especially in England, the US, and Greece, spiritualism, faith healing, neo-romanticism in art, as, as Chick mentioned, the rise of the independent Catholic movement and the Gnostic Church, and the veritable explosion of esoteric orders in France. By now, due to Eastern exploration and the expansion of empires during that century, this now interest in the occult now included the Eastern traditions as well. We find Buddhist and Hindu practices sitting comfortably alongside the Western mysticism and the schools of ancient Greece, Rome, and Egypt, to say nothing of Scandinavian and other mythologies too. But even as the century came to its end, the seeds were already in place for the next great upheaval. By 1914, the world was once again at war and its inhabitants had little time for the frivolous occupation of looking into their souls and seeking higher beliefs. However, as before, the flame of Gnosis was carried forward by a brave few. And in World War II, it was a French mystic, Robert Ambelin, in Paris, who together with a small group of redoubtable souls in Lyon, under the puppet Vichy government, which kept the spark alive as in small groups under totalitarian regimes in Greece, communist Russia, and fascist Spain. In America, Israel Regardi was writing his four-volume expose of the Golden Dawn or the Stella Machetina to the enthusiastic reception of the Supreme Magi of the English and American Rosicrucian societies. And we actually have their letters writing back to each other. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about the Blitz. Did you get Regardi's latest book? 
You actually got letters of the two supreme magi writing to each other during the war. And again, we see the burgeoning of esoteric activity towards the latter part of the 1900s, with the rise of Wiccan, even the Church of Satan, and the ragtag of composite beliefs which we bundle under the term New Age, together with the revival of many earlier groups, ranging from the Golden Dawn to Martinism and the Yellow Cohen, although in a modernized form to meet the expectations of a new generation. And here we are now, in the middle of the 20s and the 21st century, wondering if yet another war or political differences are going to tear us apart, forcing us again to focus on how to protect ourselves from ravaging viruses and the threat of extremism, rather than being able to enjoy the luxury of meditating on higher things. Only time will tell. But following our detour into the philosophy of cycles, let's return to the matter in hand. The occult revival of the 19th century was often attributed to a French ordained deacon, although he was never a priest, later an author and magician called Alphonse Louis Constant, better known, as we heard, as Eliphas Levy. However, it can also be said that similar currents of thought were developing across many European countries and America, both North and South, at that time. But for our story, it is a French doctor, Dr. Gérard Ancus, better known by his Nomen Mysticum of Pappus, that we must turn for the continuation of the story on Martinism. Obtaining his doctorate in medicine from a paper from a, with a paper on philosophical anatomy and working as a hypnotist at a renowned school of hypnotherapy in Paris, he was what we would now call a joiner. He counted Maitre Philippe, he, he handed around Maitre Philippe uh, of Lyon, who was a renowned contemporary mystic and healer, and Alexandre Saint-Yves d'Alvedre among his mentors. He founded a few groups of his own and joined and joined and joined and left and joined and left. In succession, the Golden Dawn of McGregor Mathis in Paris, the French Theosophical Society, the Hermetic Brotherhood. But in each one, he went in and then just kind of left after a time. And also, becoming disillusioned with conventional Catholicism, he ended up joining Jules Duarnel's newly formed Gnostic Church, based on his visions of the Cathol Albigensian Church, which had been widespread in Languedoc in southwest France before the infamous Crusades against them in 20, 1209, which continued with persecution, wars, and the Inquisition until the siege of Montsegur in 1243 effectively ended the Cathars, whose so-called heresy amounted to little more than a moral disgust at the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church of the times and their belief that women held equal places in ministry, that, angel, that humans are angels imprisoned in corruptible bodies, and beliefs like that, which would certainly account for their attractiveness to a Martinist. If you remember just how ghastly the crusade at that time was, uh, the king of the time actually opened up all the prisoners and allowed all the murderers out, uh, and all the rapists, everyone who were the dregs of society, and encouraged them to join the crusade, saying they would get complete pardons if they did. And there's the infamous story after the siege of Cahors when the uh, governing uh, general, uh, when they finally pulled down the walls, and one of his soldiers turned to the general and said, but how will we be able to tell who are Cathar and who are Roman Catholics? And you may know the infamous reply, kill them all, God will know his own. Now, if... He had just written a few books on tarot and the Kabbalah, etc. Pappus would probably have been relegated to history as little more than one of the many occult revivalists or authors of the late 19th century, who happened to write a few books at the time. But his true claim to immortality lies in an unusual event he claims took place in 1884, when a chance encounter with another mystically inclined Frenchman, Augustin Chabosseau, revealed that they both received initiation into so-called Martinist orders through different chains of succession linking them back to Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin and his disciples. Pappas claimed to have been given papers by Pasquale and the rights of the order of Saint-Martin by Henry de Large, and together they exchanged lines in the manner of bishops and then set about founding an order to consolidate their understanding and to preserve it for posterity, which led to the formation of the Ordre Martiniste or Martinist order Pappas claimed that all he had received throughout his initiation was three points and two letters. The three points form part of the Martinist sigil he created, and the two letters are assumed to be SI, superior inconnu, or unknown superior, which are also incorporated into it. The story is certainly very, very satisfying, but uh, like Chick's story about uh, Sprengel, there's little proof to back it up. 
And it also sounds alarmingly similar to the founding of most esoteric societies. Von Hun's right of strict observance and its secret chiefs, the Hermetic Order Gordon, uh, Golden Dawn with the ciphers from Sprengel, to the Societas Rusicristiana in Angola, the of Robert Wentworth Little, where he claimed he must found a mysterious uh, Rosicrucian ritual in the forgotten corner of the library at the Grand Lodge of England, and so on and so forth. Because as we said earlier on, we find a little veneer of respectability goes a long way to lend mystery and interest and intrigue to a new order. The order was structured not unlike Freemasonry, notwithstanding the fact that neither founder was a Mason. Though Pappas later joined the order of Memphis Misraim, and on the death of John Yarka went on to become its grand hierophant. So they created three degrees, again surprisingly, with their own rituals for the associate, initiate, and unknown superior. In this case, the last degree did not suggest that the person had actually passed to a higher plane, but they should remain unknown to their contemporaries. And to remember an important quote from Saint Martin himself, I never wanted to make any noise. The initials SI identified a Martinist who also had secret signs like masonry and passwords of recognition. In the ceremonies and his private work in his oratory, which we see here, reminiscent of the practices of the Yellow Cohen, he wore a mask and a mantle, actually not in this one, I think he loved having his photo taken. But normally he'd wear a mask and a mantle, sy symbolically to protect himself from the attacks of unseen forces, but also to remind himself of his insignificance and that his focus should be solely on reintegration with the divine. He promoted his order with a regular magazine, L'Initiation, Initiation obviously, which to its credit, with a couple of gaps during the two wars, continues to be published to this day, on a moderately regular basis. While the number of members was never enormous, as esoteric societies go, it was one of the most successful of its time, rivaling that of the Theosophical Society and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. But its approach was considerably more focused on the practices of saint Martin in his later years, and despite Pappas' interest in more practical magic, especially Solomonic magic, the order itself focused almost exclusively on mystical Christianity, personal development and meditation and introspection, which, as we heard, saint called the way of the heart. The order spread to other countries, making its way into most European lands with quite a lot of success, even into the United States under the phenomenal musician Edward Blitz, who we remember had also tried to introduce the Scottish rectified rite some years earlier. But unfortunately, despite giving, uh, receiving a, cha a charter from Pappas, he immediately set about rectifying the order, adding degrees all over the place, and trying to bring it into masonry. Pappas got tired of this, removed him as the delegate to the United States, and replaced him with Margaret Peake, making two symbols there. Firstly, she was a well-known esoteric character, and also, of course, she was a woman, because he wanted to make sure that Martinism did not just get subsumed as a Masonic order. Now, Pappas himself allegedly had designs on further developing Martinism, but unfortunately World War I came along and he died of tuberculosis in 1916, working as a doctor in a field hospital during the First World War. In England, at that time, the Golden Dawn was going through its death throes as well, thrust into the prurient spotlight of public opinion as the scandals of the Horos affair played out in graphic detail in the tabloid press. And in America, the scandals surrounding faked seances and the demise of Martinism saw the esoteric revival falter and finally return to its dormant state, maintained once more by a small handful of quiet men and women who carried the flame forward through the many decades until there was time for the flame to rego. For there are always disciples who work in obscurity until it's time to bring to light the secret which had lain buried as masonry teaches us. And perhaps we should just briefly consider another interesting fact. While the esoteric orders appear to flourish and die around the end of each century, why is it that Freemasonry has survived almost untroubled for over three centuries? While its membership numbers may rise and fall and grand lodges may fall victim to totalitarian regimes, one of, its first signs of, one of the first signs of the country's return to democracy has always been a resurgence in Freemasonry in the country as a core organization. Is this because of the message it carries? Is it the fact that it normally boasts royal or presidential patronage? Is it the network of supranational connections which maintain it through difficult times? 
Is it the fact it can adapt in times of stress and warfare from being a body of free thinkers into a fraternal organization which provides friendships and fraternity to those under duress? The enduring nature of Freemasonry in the face of all attempts to kill it. While esoteric orders rise and fall like waves on a beach, it's certainly worth a little time of meditation and perhaps even more formal study. Indeed, even for esoteric orders, the flames were kept alive during such times by a few. It's interesting to note that while Freemasonry has always been seen as a threat to totalitarian regimes, think anything from the Iron Curtain through Nazism to General Franco, and for my part, even in England, if you remember, just a decade and a half ago when the Labour Party in England created the infamous list which all judges or policemen had to publicly declare that they were Freemasons. I mean, even in a free country this happened, which is terrifying to me. But despite all this, we know why, because all extremists are scared by groups of people who assemble in private to talk. But why Freemasons had to declare their membership and were quite often locked up and put in prison? Martinists, for some reason, were always selected for even worse punishment. In Germany, under the Vichy government in occupied France and under General Franco in Spain, while being a Mason would be subject to one to imprisonment, membership in Martinism was invariably punishable by death. The Third Reich's obsession with esoteric subjects led them to take Lyon apart brick by brick in search of its esoteric heritage. Mercifully, everything had been hidden well before they came. And Constant Chevion, the head of the Martinist order at the time, and a Gnostic bishop, was executed by Petinist thugs in 1944. To say that little of esoteric note occurred during the period following the First World War would be to do a number of organizations an injustice. I mean, Alistair Crowley, the Great Beast, was doing his thing in Europe, the United States and Canada, and other orders were ticking over. Independent Catholicism was quietly breeding and spreading its tentacles as an alternative to dogmatic Christianity. Amork was buying ad space on the back covers of Marvel comics. But it was not until the inevitable approach of World War II when things began to move again in anticipation of an overwhelming dark force which threatened existence itself, Nazi Germany. However, even through the current of the Scottish rectified rite had been carried into England and the States, there was little understanding of the history and importance of the rectified rite. And if anyone truly understand what it stood for, chances are they weren't members. In England, membership at that time was restricted to the nine most senior members of the Grand Preceptory, while in the United States, membership was restricted to a maximum of two people per state, usually past Grand Masters or the state heads of the Scottish Rite. And we all know how deeply these people understand Masonic heritage, symbolism, and esotericism, with one wonderful exception, sir. For the second time, apart from the lines being passed on, Martinism in all its forms had suffered virtually a second death. The Ella Cohen were dead, having been formally closed down by its grand sovereign, Ivan Mosca, though one country, actually Canada, refused to recognize his authority and never did close. Martinism had been reduced again to a tiny, small, if devoted membership, since Christian mystical orders were hardly the rage at the time. And the rectified rite was a little more than a couple of dining clubs and an annual meeting in Switzerland. Despite the tragic times, the core order of Martinism did survive, carried forward by a few faithful breasts. In Spain, Martinist groups met in secret, even though membership was lethal under General Franco. And in Paris, one man who we met, Robert Ambelin, who was to become a legend, held meetings under the very noses of the Nazi occupiers. Ambelin not only preserved the order, but went on to write many books about it, including the story of how he kept the order alive during the Second World War and even created a revised version of Pasquale's Order of Ella Cohen, even though most of the original texts at that time had been lost. And after the war, Martinism began to stir again. By 1957, Philippe Oncos, Pappas' son, now presided over the revival of his father's Order Martin East. And since then, Martinism has spread to every corner of the world. But as so often happens in an order in which the ego is meant to be suppressed and the practitioner remain unknown and silent in his workings, the order, as usual, rapidly splintered into lots of groups, each claiming to be the one true successor of the line. And when you think about it, this is absolute nonsense, since no currently existing order can do more than claim a line going back to Pappas or Shabasso, and in doing so prove once again they're cousins of all other valid Martinist orders. Once again, hubris and the human ability to take something pure and precious and destroy it 
rears its ugly head. So in our current time, modernism has survived, mainly as a series of internet-connected orders which offer a platform of mystical, magical, theurgic, Gnostic, and Masonic teachings. Given the spiritual nature of the teachings which permeate the Martins family, there will inevitably be a church associated with it, normally Gnostic, offering ordination to all those who feel the calling but don't want to wear the straitjacket of formalized dogma and see ordination as a personal route to God rather than an excuse to impose one's values on other people and to proselytize. Acts of kindness and acts of spiritual healing are performed in secret. As Christ said, those who act in secret will be rewarded in secret, for God sees in secret. And the member rarely reveals his or her affiliation to anyone who's not likewise a member. The order is an organization which practices charity of the heart, and the only money which changes hands is when sharing costs to hire room to make materials, or for more than one, or if more than one organization has actually been expelled from the family for trying to charge for dues or lessons or initiations. Its approach is essentially Christian, since they're based on the teachings of two Christian mystics, Saint Martin and Jacob Burma, but neither of whom, of course, can be said to be Orthodox Christian. I mean, as you know, the Jacob Burma was persecuted like mad by his local bishop, and Saint Martin had really moved away from the formal Catholic Church. So again, it's a peaceful and a peaceable path, a quiet place for one to examine oneself, and a support structure for those who, like Neo in the Matrix, wake up to find themselves in a hostile world and needing advice on how to proceed along the path now they know they can never turn back. And finally, it is open to men and women, and both are able to pursue whatever paths they wish in this mystical Gnostic landscape. Martinism, as we saw, suffered two catastrophes and now enjoys a third period of peace. But for a third time, we are now in that dangerous early period of our century, which so often has seen that war and destruction, which tears away our desire to reunite with the numinous and forces us to focus on Malkuth and the needs of the flesh. Let us all hope that this time we'll get it right. So, despite Martinism being an order independent from Masonry, we can see it probably would not have existed without it. Its roots are in the collective and independent work of three avid Freemasons, and if masonry hadn't taken the bold step of divorcing itself from any religion at an early stage, and if the French Revolution hadn't come when it did, the goals of the convents of Gaul and Wilhelmsbad might have been realized, and continental Freemasonry, at least, might have become a single system based on Pasquale, or Martinism. Despite this not taking place, Martinism has borrowed its structure and most of its terminology from Freemasonry, including its meeting places, pooled lodges or chapters, and its system of grades. It's come close to being absorbed into Masonry on occasion, which might also explain the terror the order seems to strike in the hearts of the good old boys whenever they hear it mentioned, since they see it as a potential rival to good dues-paying members, and positively subversive in its belief in charging nothing. And of course, it is religious in its foundations, yet not aligned to any traditional form of Christianity, as it's Gnostic in its teachings, and it strives to a higher goal in making men just better. Fortunately, Freemasonry is not a threat anymore to its existence, any more than attacking a person for belonging to a church or a golf club is stand up in court. What happens outside a lodge room stays outside the lodge room. But in any case, as I hope we have seen, there is more than ample room for both under heaven and earth. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Pastor. You're very welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, brethren, at this time I would like to... Um, recognize two individuals also that have been helping tremendously today, uh, Ms. Jan Harms and Brother Charlie Curl in the back uh, on, on the audio with uh, the voice and everything and setting everything up for us. So thank you, Jan. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much for all this. At this time, yep. <laughs> at this time we're going to break for lunch, so please go ahead, proceed to um, go downstairs so we can indulge in uh, some nourishment and uh, after that we'll return back for our
the third speaker of the day, Mrs. Uh, Tabitha Cicero. Uh, please remember there's a, uh, a voluntary uh, donation of $10 uh, as, as you proceed for the lunch downstairs. Thank you so much. Go ahead. 